Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon and welcome to the latest episode of our sports show, sports show. As you know, we've been previewing live on air for the last couple of weeks now of our upcoming rugby documentary. We're based here in the heartland of Munster Rugby. So we have a passionate fan base that are enthusiastically looking forward to this uh, documentary. It's called Global Rugby Legends, My Life in Rugby. So we're looking at renowned rugby players from yesteryear and even some current players uh, that have made their mark in terms of the world game. So we're looking at the Southern Hemisphere, we're looking at Australia, New Zealand, Argentina and the All Blacks and New Zealand. And from the Northern Hemisphere, we're looking at Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, France and Italy. And we have a bit of uh, je ne sais quoi, a bit of French flair with us uh, this evening, La Sacre Bleu, as they call it, in terms of uh, the French flair of rugby. And he was this guy was one of the pioneers of in the terms of the French flair, in terms of the backs. He played in the centre. He played in the wing uh, throughout the, the, the 90s and late 90s and into the early uh, 2000s. His career in rugby club career from 1994 up as far as 1997 and even after that, he played with the likes of Rossing, Stade Francais. He came over to England for a time, played with Worcester, and then obviously finished up with Rossing Metro 92 as well. From 1998 to uh, 2001, he made over 12 appearances for France, uh, scoring five points. His first cap for France was November the 14th, 1998, 1998 against Argentina. And he's appeared in numerous uh, Six Nations, uh, most memorably in the 2001 Six Nations. He's played centre and wing for most of his career, the one and only Thomas Lombard. Uh, Thomas, first of all, thanks for joining us uh, this evening. And uh, when you look back at your sort of career with France and your sort of club career, and it's going back now roughly, I think we're going 20 years now since that uh, Six Nations Championship in 2001. Do you start to struggle sometimes with memories? Uh, do you start to have to pinch yourself and say, did it really happen? <laughs> That's a tough one to, uh, to start. At, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for, for me to meet. Um, yeah, it's been a while, I have to say. Even uh, I'm still dreaming about uh, getting back in the game. But um, I think that... Uh, uh, I've been a privileged guy um, playing the likes of uh, uh, Stade Francais, Racing. These are uh, some uh, incredible teams and incredible clubs uh, in, in, in France. Plus uh, the, the privilege to play for the national side. So lots of strong memories uh, every single time, uh, like everywhere in the world when we, when we meet former players, uh, we were part of the same group. Uh, we keep talking about uh, our games for sure, parties uh, as well. And uh, the, the, the way we, 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 we managed to get together to create a special culture, uh, mostly at Stade Francais, uh, which was a, an amazing part of my career with an amazing chairman, uh, Max Guazzini, amazing player as well. And um, I'm now in charge of that club, so it's, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, challenging for me to renew with, uh, with this uh, fantastic history. And Thomas, before I take you back to your childhood, I just want to touch now, French rugby has gone through a renaissance in the last few years after somewhat of a period of being in the doldrums in the early sort of uh, 2000s. But you were probably in the height of maybe the last sort of French, great sort of French sides. Uh, I preferably remember the 1999 Rugby World Cup team that shocked the world, beating the All Blacks with Dominici, Bernard Salle, Intermac, La Maison, all these sort of ties. And these were all your mates. These were all your guys that you went up against on a regular basis in terms of fighting for that Le Bleu sort of jersey is what they call it. And then... Roll, we roll fast on into maybe from 2007 up until around maybe 2016, 2017. French rugby was in a very, very low place uh, in terms of where their national side was. But now you're coming into a World Cup and this time around it's preparation for us. And France are probably going as, as the strongest of the Northern Hemisphere. A grand slam in their pocket. DuPont, Rugby World Player of the Year. 
probably down to probably one of the greats now of the game. So is it amazing to see that French rugby is back in a good place? And did you fear for it for a time there being so heavily involved? In it? Did you think your generation was going to be the last of the golden generation of French rugby players? No, I don't. I don't think so. But um, uh, if you look backwards, uh, French rugby has on, has always been uh, able to do some amazing things and such poor things. Uh, and I, th I think that the, the main difference now is that for sure we have an amazing generation of players. You you mentioned Antoine Dupont. We can also talk of Grégory Aldrit, of uh, uh, Romain Tamac, and so many other players in the team. Uh, but what we have now is consistency. And um, on a regular basis, we can compete with the same, the same level of intensity, the same level of uh, accuracy. And um, that's for me the main change. And it comes from, for sure, some uh, work has been done through the academies in France uh, with the youth, uh, because our under 19 has been. Uh, uh, winning the, 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 the World Cup titles uh, twice in a row. Um, so it helps creating a special culture around the winning uh, side of rugby. And we develop our um, squad um, around the coaching, um, the coaching uh, staff, the likes of uh, uh, foreign, player, um, foreign coaches uh, joining um, like Sean Edwards, for example, uh, Fabien Galtier, uh, Laurent Labitte, Karim Gezal. We have a much more bigger squad um, around coaching than, than we used to do in the past. We were a bit uh, conservative in France. One coach, one assistant, and that's it. And now I think that if you want to compete, you need to put the player uh, in a situation that uh, means uh, as soon as he arrives in the national side, he will learn more than uh, what he's learning on a day-to-day -day basis when he's uh, in his club. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this was not the case before. And now uh, we have a, a, a huge amount of talent all around, in the team, around the team, outside the team, and it creates uh, this uh, successful story. But uh, you know that we are our best enemies. And as soon as French is uh, not underdog, we are we we are uh, uh, in a, we are not in a very good position. So it will be interesting to see now uh, during the Six Nation and for sure during the World Cup, how we gonna uh, deal with this new status of favorite for the for the World Cup. And Thomas Lombard, I'm going to take you back to your childhood now, growing up. Uh, did you come from a house you had a, a football, which, and a family, brothers and sisters that were steeped in rugby? Was it very much a soccer sort of housing where you're close to Marseille and Monaco and Lyon, the big, big sort of French rugby, the French sort of soccer powerhouses? Or was it very much a rugby sort of stronghold that you grew up in, in terms of where you were located, where you were sort of located in the Biarritz? Uh, the Toulouse sort of area in France growing up? No, not really. I, I was, I, I was, uh, I grew in a, in a family where my dad used to play rugby a um, long time ago when he was young. And um, I was, I was playing tennis. Uh, I have no brother and sister. So one day my dad came and see me and said, uh, oh, Thomas, I think it, it could be useful for you to go and play a sport where you can share something with uh, some other boys uh, on the same age. And uh, I was a bit selfish, probably, uh, like a, a, um, a, young, a young boy. You are the favorite from your mom and dad. You're not used to share anything with, uh, with some sisters and brothers. So, uh, yeah, th this was a... Um, um, a big boost uh, for me in terms of um, mindset, uh, mentality, um, to look after the others, to expect something from them as well, and to discover that you can grow uh, and become a better person um, 
if you are if you if you take care of others and if you use them and uh Thomas, in terms of yourself uh, growing up in terms of pursuing sort of rugby, rugby didn't turn professional into the late sort of 90s and sort of such. So growing up as a child, playing uh, your youth stage, uh, probably into your, say, sort of late teens, rugby was a, a very much an amateur sort of sport. So obviously you had to think academically wise as well in terms of a job, money, in terms of a future. And rugby was probably a pastime, you know, we all know that probably 1% of ro French rugby players go on and represent their country. If not, that percentage is probably even lower again. So uh, what would, what were your thoughts in second, after finishing your second school? What was the dream for Thomas Lombard? Was it Lombard? Was it to be an apprentice? Was it to be an electrician? Was it to be a businessman? And were you on the path to achieving those things before rugby took off? Uh, the plan was to to become a sport journalist. Okay. Um, so I can say that with another pathway, uh, I managed to 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 do this this job for I think thirteen years before taking the job at Stade Français. I was involved as a as a journalist in Canal Plus and uh, on the radio uh, RMC. Uh, that was a great experience for me. But as you said, uh, you had no choice uh, in these days. Uh, you had to prepare uh, the future, going to school, going to university, or going directly to, the, to find a job. Uh, now it's a bit different. And uh, I think that, I will not say that rugby is, is, is going in the wrong direction, but I think that the balance between studies and professionalism uh, is not the right one at the moment. Um, let's say, uh, let's consider uh, how many time, how many hours a day um, a young kid from uh, any academy in the world um, is using to train. Three, four, five hours, no more. But at the moment, we are trying to, to put the focus only on rugby. But mm -hmm. he has time to do a, a study, he has time to go to university, and he has time um, in the same uh, in the same time as playing as a rugby player to prepare his future, and I think that unfortunately or fortunately, uh, you cannot develop yourself uh, only playing rugby. Hmm. You need to do you need to 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 have a different in, uh, uh, center of interest. You need to uh, um, to see different people than the one you are playing with. Uh, you need to go through uh, uh, job experiences. You need to, and, and, and this kind of life is only possible if you are not 100% uh, focused on rugby. Hmm. So uh, that's what I'm trying to achieve now uh, at Stade Francais, to bring back the double project uh, in the club philosophy. Uh, Thomas, you might be aware of here in Ireland, our, our national sports is called Gaelic and our two national sports is called football and hurling. But there's a big thing in our sports in terms of the moment about strength and conditioning and these strength and conditioning experts and they're overloading youngsters and young teens as 15 or 16 about being in the gyms the whole time. And as well about how many push ups you can do and what you can weigh and what you can squat. And do you feel maybe uh, I remember back playing the sports in my day, it was get out with the ball or in the field. There was no thought of what a gym or there was no thought of what you could lift or what you could press. And it was never really a sort of a requirement as such. It was the, the fun of playing the game. Is is Are you seeing in sport in your own terms in rugby in France that maybe these sports conditioning guys and these gym guys are taking over and drowning the passion out of your love of sport and rugby that they're working these guys to the point where their bodies can't take it and they're breaking down? I think I think honestly we are we are at the limit, and uh, I was watching the game between France and uh, South Africa uh, last Saturday in Marseille. It was brutal. There was uh, three or four uh, um, uh, had had a um, um, commotion during this game. Um, I think we really need to ask the question now um, on. What do we want to do with rugby? And what do we want to do with rugby player? Uh, we play more and more uh, games every year. 
uh, international rugby, club rugby. Now there is a World Cup uh, club competition on the table. Uh, will probably uh, arrive in 2025 or 2024. So uh, we cannot play uh, with the, 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 the body and the health of, of our player. So we really, really need to think about it and probably to change the law. And for me, the first uh, thing we need to, to think about is replacement. 25 years ago, you had no replacement. You had only replacement for injuries. Mm. Now you have coaching. And the problem with coaching is that you have to, to you maintain the, the intensity of the game during 80 minutes. But you have, you have not the possibility to change 15 players. So mm. some players will stay the whole game and others will not. Let's, let's take the example of forwards they can turn and play 30 minutes, rest 10 minutes, get back in play for another 20 minutes, rest. It's not normal. So for me, if you decrease uh, the, the, the possibility to use the replacement, you will oblige the player to, um, to control uh, their engagement and to control their physicality for uh, 80 minutes. So. Globally, the, 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 the very, very strong players, the very, very heavy players will need to lose weight. Otherwise, they will not be able to play for 80 minutes. Hmm. You see what I mean? And yeah. uh, you, you will change the game. You will have more space because players will, get will be tired for sure. So it will open space rather than um, changing players and boom, boom, boom until from the first until the last minute. And uh, Thomas, in terms of your own highlights, in terms of that debut against Argentina in 1998 and see following on from that, and you came in for a time when French rugby, when there was so much sort of competition and players were coming in at that French team. If you didn't set the world alight, obviously it was who's the next guy because there were so many guys and that guy didn't or just set the world alight or that other light there was back to you so there was almost that sort of sense that guy if you get the chance you have to deliver straight from the off there are no second chances given the ferocity of the competition in terms of the French facts yeah yeah it's always it's always very spe special when you play um, any teams when you are French and I, I guess that when you prepare to play France, wherever you are, because everything is possible, mm. always. Uh, they can be on fire. Uh, they, can, they can turn up. We can turn up very, uh, very easily. And um, there's a sort of a unpre un unpredictable um, uh, game plan to, uh, to adopt when you play against a French team. But I have to say that now we are more and more predictable because that's that's the evolution of the sports. But um, yeah, French rugby has always been uh, uh, <clears throat> um, has always been a bit of French flair, and I think that we need to we need to stick to it because it's part of our history, it's part of our uh, legacy, and that's probably the story of France, who um, French are never agree with laws, I'll never agree with anything. And they want to do things by, by themselves. And that's why they can take that kind of, of uh, that kind of freedom and they can do, do some silly things on the pitch, but also some amazing things. Mm. And starting off uh, back with the time which you would uh, played against Ireland uh, in the centre of that sort of French team, uh, when you played in the centre, you would have came up against uh, uh, Dricko, as they call him here, Brian O'Driscoll and Gordon Darcy. The Darcy sort of D D and D, the Darcy Driscoll uh, combination. Uh, did you sort of enjoy that sort of battles and tussles and pit? Because Darcy was the guy who sort of 
sort of they made the straight line sort of runs the dart but O'Driscoll had the, had the, the dancing piece as they call it the fancy piece that he could step off left step off right uh, at any sort of given so to you, in terms of your eyes you had to he was more dangerous coming off the left than he was sometimes coming off the right in terms of he could go both ways while Darcy was the guy who was just a sniper who just looked for that gap and tried to try to go through it I, I think these these two uh, could have been French <laughs> because there are some uh, they both were gifted players uh, unpredictable and with amazing skills and uh, uh, great rugby players that probably one of the uh, most exciting uh, pair of centers uh, in the, 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 the last decades. Uh, so, yeah, massive respect for these two guys. Uh, a few uh, uh, bad nights uh, when we had to play against them, um, even if we played them through the French, uh, with the French teams, but we also played them um, in uh, European Cup games. Against Leinster, uh, yeah, uh, against Leinster, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very, very nice. But again, that that that's a privilege when you are when you are a competitor, when you are uh, an international rugby player. You want to play against the best one of the of the world. You don't want to play uh, easy games. Hmm. And when you look at the time when you played in the the Five Nations uh, before it came the sort of Six Nations with Italy, and Italy has is a growing country, and it's going to take them a while to build up the history and the sort of heritage, but in terms of where they're sort of coming from. But do you almost look like, do you almost look like the Ireland, the Wales, the Scotland, the England? Do you always say the tradition, the heritage? We could always get up for each other. We always have mutual expect. And Italy, it's going to just take that bit longer for them to to find their feet in terms of that competition, given that there's such a, a new terms to it. You mean Italy? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I, I, um, I, um, we played the first game uh, I played the first game when Italy uh, joined the the, the Six okay. Nation. Uh, wow. That was very special because the talisman for Italy was uh, Diego Dominguez, and he was my mate. Uh, we played uh, we played together at Stade Français for eight seasons, so I knew him very well. And um, uh, it was a very special atmosphere. Uh, sunny day, twenty five degrees in Rome, uh, amazing. Uh, Having the coffee outside the hotel, and then suddenly you say, "Oh, we go, we go, we play a game now against uh, Italy." Was that Italy? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think they uh, they did well uh, when Diego Dominguez, when uh, Troncon, when uh, Massimo Giovanelli, all all these kind of of players who help Italy to to enter uh, in this in the Six Nation, and after. There, there, there was a lack of uh, new generation uh, after them. I think they made some, some step forward, moving to the Celtic League, um, trying to, to, to get all, all their players in two franchises. But uh, I think that the, the next step for them uh, is to develop rugby uh, in Italy. Uh, at the moment, they cannot compete. There, there's only one collective sport in Italy. It's football. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't have the money and they don't have the, the, the human resource uh, at the moment to develop this. But I have, to, I have to say on the other side that they are fighting well. Uh, they've got some really good uh, new generation of players arriving. If you look at uh, the development of their youth side, like uh, under 20, uh, it's, it's, it's really improving. But I think that there will always be a limit, mm -hmm. uh, and to go above, uh, you need to you need to develop the rugby uh, through the whole country. Mm. And finally, Thomas, before I let you go, Thomas Lambert, if you were to look in the mirror now and you saw a 26, 27 year old Tom, Thomas Lambert, that je ne sais quoi, that bit of French flair. Uh, it, how would you describe him in terms of a rugby player and the journey he's gone through in terms of world rugby and the man that he's met him today and obviously sitting proud now as the, the chairman of Stade Francais? Uh, what, was, what was his uniqueness? What did he bring to a team w when he was going well? I think I was, I was, a, I was a good rugby player, but I was, I was not... Uh, I was not um... 
really, really talented, like uh, Christophe Dominici or like Diego Dominguez. But I've been lucky enough to play uh, in a club, uh, Stade Francais, where I was driven, I was driven by uh, such talented players. And uh, that's, that's life. Uh, sometimes you are at the right place at the right moment. So I use I used the talent of this player to develop myself. Uh, they inspire me. Uh, I work I work a lot, um, and that's probably uh, what I would say to to someone asking me uh, uh, what what you what you retain for for from from that period. So uh, take your chance, enjoy the moment. Uh, be humble and try to bring as much as you can to the team because uh, unfortunately uh, it goes very, very quickly. And sometimes, you know, um, when you are here for five, six, seven years, you try, you, you, you miss the opportunity to enjoy because uh, it's been, uh, yeah, maybe a, a bit of time that you are here. So you are you try to complain. You try to instead of looking the the, the empty glass, you the half empty glass. You you the half full glass. Sorry, you 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 watch the the, the half empty glass, and uh, yeah, that that's something some someone need to say to you that um, uh, it's always a privilege to be part of a team. It's always a privilege uh, to work, uh, to be involved in a, in, a, in a club, if it's Stade Francais or any other club in the world. And um, uh, you have the chance to wear the jersey. So you have to make sure yeah, that you will, you will make people around you proud. Uh, you will bring some joy to them. And um, you will play for the, one, uh, for the ones who have not the chance to wear it. On that note, uh, Thomas Lombard, Kyle, thanks for joining us uh, this evening to share what is a renowned sort of rugby uh, career. 12 appearances for France, uh, five points, uh, made your debut in 1998 against Argentina, played for a literary of clubs, Racing, Stanford, say, Worcester, Racing Metro 92, and now find yourself as the chairman of your beloved uh, club, Stanford, say. This is your life in rugby, my global uh, rugby legends, uh, global rugby legends, my life in rugby, Thomas Lombard, that's your story. Take care, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation.